All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much, Frank. Um, I'd like to start by thanking people who have made my research and this presentation possible. Um, thanks to Central Michigan University and the Clark Historical Library for hosting this evening, and especially to Frank Bowles for inviting me to give the presentation, and to Brian Whitledge for his fine technical support today. Really needed that. And I'm also very grateful to others who've supported my work. Of course, Grand Valley State University and my colleagues and students in the English department where I teach linguistics in the Applied Linguistics program. And the University of Wisconsin Press who published my book, Uper Talk, Dialect as Identity in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And the many participants who've made the research possible uh, my friends and family, and of course you. It's a real joy for me to present my research to you tonight. My presentation will focus on the history and development of English in the northwestern part of the Upper Peninsula. Um, and I'll explain how the dialect has emerged over time. And I look forward to your questions and comments following my presentation. I'm going to share my screen with you now. And... Great. Uh, you can all see this, I hope. And um, it's working fine, Catherine. Great. Thank you for letting me know. And I'm going to read and talk a little bit together. And I do that because I could talk about this all night long and I don't think you want to be here all night long. So uh, with that, let me get started here. And I focus on my, re my research on the northwestern um, part of the Upper Peninsula from Mar Marquette up through the west, west and the Keweenaw Peninsula, which you see circled here on the map. I chose this region for two reasons. Um, not only because this is where I have the most contacts. I went to Michigan Tech as a, a graduate student, PhD in the humanities program. And um, because I lived there for five years, I made a lot of friends in the area, and they've helped introduce me to people and places and events, and so I had, I've had a lot of contacts. But more importantly, this is the area that's home to the stereotypical Uper voice um, and Uper identity. That doesn't mean this voice and identity doesn't exist in other parts of the Upper Peninsula, but because this area is the most isolated and the most remote, um, there are features of the dialect here, um, and it's also based on immigration and some things I'll explain that this is where that um, ubiquitous um, Uper voice comes from. I'm particularly interested in how the idea of a dialect has emerged through social and historical events, such as immigration and language contact between English and all of the languages that immigrants have brought with them over time as well as in the indigenous Ojibwe or Anishinaabemowin. I'm also interested in economic factors like mining, agriculture, timber, and tourism, and their effects on bringing people to the area, on people mixing and mingling, and ling then language attitudes that we have and that we reinforce through media, such as movies, TV, social media posts, memes, in our everyday conversations with friends and family, co-workers, uh, if we're in the classroom, teachers, students. And this evening I'll explain that the dialect, the words, sounds, grammatical structures, are a result of social factors and historical events that continue to change the demographics or who comes to the area and who leaves. So we'll be talking a lot about um, immigration and um, settlement patterns as well. To understand what makes a dialect a dialect, it's really important to know its history. The history of English in the Northwestern UP is relatively recent compared to other varieties found throughout the United States and even in the Lower Peninsula. It wasn't until the mid 19th century that English speakers regularly visited and then inhabited this region. The dialect's recent history combined with the area's isolation the people who've immigrated to the area, where they settled, the languages that they spoke, and are all factors that maintain the dialect and its distinct features. There are five major factors that have helped the dialect to develop into the variety it is today. Geography, particularly isolation that I mentioned a little while ago. If you think about it, it's about 500 miles from Detroit to 
um, the key went off. Historical events in the late 1800s and early 1900s, such as the French Prussian War and World War I, that pushed people toward other places from Europe and Scandinavia, um, including the US in general, but specifically the UP. Language contact between speakers of English and other languages, including Italian, Polish, German, Canadian, French, Finnish, Ojibwe, and like I mentioned, it's also called Anishinaabemowin, um, Chinese, many other languages. Economics is also a factor, including access to land, availability of land, mining, agriculture, shipping, and tourism, and language attitudes, what we think of as good and bad English. Oops. Um, to begin, an important definition, and I'm sure you all know what a Uber is, but um, just in case, here's a definition from the Merriam-Webster Collegiate Dictionary, which added Uber as a word, and you can find it online in their dictionary, um, in 2014. As you no doubt know, the name derives from the pronunciation of the acronym for the Upper Peninsula, UP, and then UR, somebody from the UP. Because Uper is a well-known word in Michigan, you might be surprised that it wasn't until 2014 that it appeared in this popular dictionary. It all began with a Scrabble game, yet it took 12 years and a persistent Scrabble player to get Uper dictionary worthy. Steve Parks solicited Merriam-Webster to include Uper beginning in 2002. Um, his 12-year letter writing campaign started with a Scrabble game in which he wanted to use Uper as a word, and the person he was playing with said, no, you can't use it, it's not in any dictionary. So Parks smartly chose one of the most popular dictionaries and wrote to the editors and said, I would like to get this word in the dictionary, and the editors at the time, 2002, and until 2014, said, no, there's not enough evidence that this word is widely enough known. For a word to be in Merriam-Webster's, and other popular dictionaries, they need to be widely known. Well, this started Parks on a quest to send evidence after evidence after evidence to the editors to include Uper and to demonstrate that it was widely known. I think really what happened, there was an editorial change and I don't know if they got tired of all his letters, but it did get in the, in the dictionary. You can find it in Merriam-Webster online in the Collegiate Dictionary right be between your Y-O-R-E, and Yoo-Hoo. It wasn't until the mid-1970s, however, that the term Uper was popularly used in UP in print, as you can see from this timeline. Now, it's important to realize that in order for a word to be in print, it exists a common word, an everyday word, technical terms are a different matter, but an everyday word has to exist in spoken conversation or signed conversation before it ever gets put into print. And so you can see the first evidence of it in print is 1975 from the newspaper, The Pick and Axe from Bessemer, Michigan. And these examples, what we end up seeing is some attitudes about what it means to be a youper. For example, 1982, the sociologist, uh, at Northern Michigan University, Michael Lukanen. He's also a filmmaker and he made a film about cultural phenomenon of youpers and he wanted to call it youpers, but there was a lot of um, resistance to that criticism, especially from older members because youpers has contested meanings. It's not always seen as a positive term and sometimes it's used in a derogatory way. So what ended up happening, he changed the name to his film, Good Man in the Woods. In 1980s, you also, I also see, and you see here, a connection between language, people, and place. There's dialect features that start to appear. So in the bumper sticker by Jack, um, excuse me, Jack Bowers, say ya to the UPA, you see this ya and da uh, and a. And then in 1986, the Youpers changed their name from the Youpers to the Youpers. So there starts to be an awareness in the 1980s of the dialect, and not that there wasn't an awareness before, but it starts to become popularized. Let's go back in time a little bit here and look at the history and how this has all come about. For at least 5,000 years, Ojibwe have lived in the UP permanently, more recently, and then seasonally 
um, before there were different treaties and things that created that situation. It wasn't until the 1600s, however, that French missionaries, French Canadian voyageurs, and European explorers regularly visited the area. Over the next century, expeditions were made to investigate the rich iron and copper deposits, which led to a determined effort to mine the region. Discovery of the world's largest deposit of native copper in 1842 by the then Michigan geologist Douglas Houghton drew thousands specifically to the Keweenaw Peninsula, and from 1840 through the early 1900s, it was a booming timber and copper mining region, boasting a population of 80,000 in 1900. We can contrast that number, 80,000, um, with the most recent census data from the Keweenaw Peninsula, and the Keweenaw Peninsula has three counties, Baraga, Houghton, and Keweenaw. And the most recent data we have for population there is 46,000. So in the early 1900s, there was about twice as many people who lived there. As a result of the copper boom, the region became known as the copper country, and most adults were in some way connected to the mines and the mining industry. The majority of those who came to work in the mines and related industries such as logging, which not was not only necessary to clear the land to get at the copper or the iron ore, if you go further um, east over toward Marquette, um, <clears throat> excuse me, or southeast. Um, it was also, timber was also really necessary for framing structures in the mine, and you can see some of that here, as well as railroad ties above and below ground for shipping, um, and specifically for the iron industry, to make charcoal for firing the kilns. And in fact, today, timber and charcoal industries are two of the main economies of the UP. And in fact, you might have a bag of Kingsford charcoal in your garage or somewhere around, and that's from Kingsford, Michigan in the UP. Because these industries um, gave the promise of prosperity, Marquette and copper, the copper country drew people from far and wide. Finland, Sweden, Norway, Ireland, Cornwall, England, Italy, I mentioned um, China earlier, Chinese, um, and throughout mostly Central um, Europe, but also Western Europe, the, um, and from in Italy, particularly the Piedmont region. Um, people also came from France and Canada and Germany and what was then called the Austrian Empire. Today that includes Croatia, Slovenia, Yugoslavia and other countries. In addition, people who resettled from the Midwest and the East Coast, particularly Boston. And if you look at a UP map, you can look at some of the place names. And in fact, here, the Quincy Mine, Quincy here refers to Quincy, Massachusetts, which is a small city south of Boston. Most of the mine managers and um, people officers were either from the Midwest or the East Coast, Boston in particular. In addition to being pulled to the region, historical events such as war and famine pushed people to the UP from Scandinavia, Finland, uh, Great Britain, Central and Eastern Europe, and beyond. While some people settled in rural areas, others were attracted to larger towns like Marquette, Ontonagon, Calumet, Houghton, and Hancock with the promise of prosperity earned from businesses and shops and even mining. Collectively, industry, agriculture, education, and commerce were needed to sustain this burgeoning population. The growing population and seemingly endless supply of copper and iron continued to draw laborers, merchants, artisans, teachers, medical personnel, doctors, and others to the region through the early 1900s when production slowed and immigration restrictions curtailed or limited people of certain nationalities from entry into the U.S. With new arrivals came many languages. For example, the group of Norwegians that you see here in the photo with their cute little dog, um, no doubt spoke Norwegian, but they might have spoken Swedish and or Finnish as well, because there was a lot of um, immigration back and forth um, between Norway, Sweden, and Finland for agricultural work. With new arrivals came um, excuse me, I said that already, um, heritage languages. And heritage languages are, is a term that we use for people whose first language or the home language. Heritage languages and cultural practices were maintained through interaction at home, in neighborhoods, rural communities, social organizations, 
and through church services. For example, in Calumet alone in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there were several language-based Catholic churches. These include St. Anthony's, which was a Polish-speaking church, St. Joseph's, which was a German-speaking church, St. Louis, a French-speaking church, Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Italian, and St. John the Baptist, Croatian. Oops. Sorry, I can't find my cursor here. Where'd it go? Let's go this way. Okay, sorry about that. So you can see this is a really multilingual community at the time. And what ends up happening is that people start learning an accented English. In addition to the example I gave with Norwegians and naming some of the languages and where people came from, Calumet school records from 1908 show that there were over 40 nationalities among their students. So we can assume that those students spoke at least half as many languages. Evidence of a multilingual community also includes Houghton Hancock newspapers that were printed in six different languages in the early 1900s. Because the majority of settlers were not native English speakers, they typically learned English from other non-native speakers, which created an accented English and helped create the, what we hear today in Euper talk. Of course, it's changed since then, and I'll talk a little bit about that. As people mixed and mingled and their languages came into repeated contact with English, this new variety developed. And these languages affected the sounds, the words, the grammatic, grammar, grammatical structures that collectively form what's called Uper talk or what we recognize as English in the Upper Peninsula. Out of all of the languages spoken in the area, Finnish has had a significant effect on English in the northwestern part of the UP. This isn't true for other parts of the UP um, as much. The influence of Finnish on English is significant for several reasons in the area. I mean, this resulted for dec from decades of contact between English and Finnish. Finns were the largest group to immigrate to this area. In fact, there are more people who claim Finnish heritage than um, in this area than any other place outside of Finland. Um, also, they were the, one of the last groups to arrive. So because their language was one of the last to come into contact with English, it has had a lasting effect. But another significant factor is Finns tended to be literate. Other working class or laborers um, who came from other countries speaking other languages tended not to be literate, but Finns, Finns tended to be literate. And in fact, in Finland, there was a law that you had to be literate in order to get married. Another factor that helped maintain fin Finnish over time is that Finnish isn't related to English. So um, it was harder for Finns to learn English, whereas German, Italian, French, Spanish, those languages, even Croatian, Slovenian, are related to English, so it makes it easier for those speakers to learn English. Another factor is that um, the lasting effect of literacy for mainly on the use of Finnish in the homes after the third generation. Typically, we find in the US and in other places too, when people immigrate to an area, the first people to immigrate, we call them the first generation, are predominantly speakers of that home or heritage language. They'll probably speak some English too and then learn some over time. The second generation or those people's children will become bilingual. Then by the third generation, what we find is a monolingual community of the third generation. So those people who came first, their grandkids will be monolingual English speakers. But because Finns tended to be literate, it helped them maintain their language through reading, writing, um, and they often lived in rural communities that were Finnish rural communities, and that helped to maintain the language for four and five generations, which is rare. So it had this lasting contact over and over again with English. This long contact shaped some of the sounds, words, and grammatical structures of an English thereby characterizing what we recognize today is the UP dialect. And in fact, some people will call it um, Finn or Finlander. 
I'll talk a little bit about um, the phonology here or sounds and how language contact, not just between English and Finnish, but other languages has affected the phonology or the sounds of the dialect. And also I'll talk about how these sounds have changed over time. So th these are some phonological features. These are just a few. And there's evidence of language contact heard in these sounds. And although all varieties of English, um, any variety, so any dialect, wherever you go in the US, um, vowels are what we notice the most. Um, consonants do change too from dialect to dialect, but not as much. And you see too, um, the beginning here, the there and this, so that the and th, um, or the often pronounced like dare or dis, or you'll hear dare dem does. You have these sounds and you see the slashes. I'm using the International Phonetic Alphabet here. T, p, and k, which we rep recognize it with T, P, and K. If they're at the end of a syllable, like yet, winter, last, you'll hear them stressed. And this is a direct relationship to Finnish. Uh, Finnish stresses these three consonants and that has carried over. Now the vowel sounds you hear, what you see low and back, you'll hear la, uh, that, last, laugh. Um, those actually, people will say that it's Finnish, but it's an influence from um, Canadian English. And there's another linguist at Grand Valley State, um, Will Rankinen, who has studied this and has found that the vowel sounds in the UP more closely match Canadian vowel sounds. Same thing with these, these are called diphthongs with that ow and I, so down, highest, you'll hear that. I'm going to play a, going to play a very short clip that lasts 12 seconds, but I can play it twice. I, I think I'll try to play it twice. Um, and these examples here on the slide, you will hear in this clip. There are two men, it's from 2013, and there it was from a TV6 news clip about the weather. Um, and I just thought it would be appropriate since it's all snowy right now. Um, but these also are appropriate because you hear these features. So let me see if this will work. And hopefully, oops, let me go back, oops. I've not done this before this way, so please bear with me. And I need to turn this up. And that's not where I wanted to go. Oops, that I didn't want to go there either. Sorry. Okay, let's try it now. Just now I like to play in and my phone will already be close down, so I gotta fix that. Yeah, the hard part uh, is controlling the wrist off all the time, you know. Last year I fell off of it, but you know, with the snow there, it, it, it's a cushion, you know, and you fall in it and it buries you and, and you just lay there and laugh, you know. So far, this is not a normal winter. It's one of the highest snow levels I remember for this time of year, but it's going to be fabulous for the businesses that depend on the snow. So I'll play this one more time here so you can listen and listen to the second man saying winter. You can hear some of the ah sounds in the first man speaking, as well as uh, dare. He says dare for there. And I think it's just really good evidence of some of these uh, features. You have to remember, though, that it's not everybody in the UP, of course, or even the Northwestern UP will sound this way. Uh, socioeconomic class, gender, um, occupations, education affect how we use language and how we use them in different contexts. So those factors are, are at work here too. So take a leather listen and listen to the vowels and some of the consonants here. The snow I like to play in and my phone will already close down, so I gotta fix that. Yeah, the hard part uh, is controlling the roof off all the time, you know. Last year I fell off of it, but you know, with the snow there, it, it, it's a cushion, you know, and you fall in it and it buries you and, and you just lay there and laugh, you know. So far, this is not a normal winter. It, it's one of the highest snow levels I remember for this time of year, but it's going to be fabulous for the businesses that depend on the snow. So let me come back here and hopefully you can see the screen. So you heard, oops, sorry, you can listen and listen to the second man saying winter. You can hear some of the ah sounds in the first man speaking as well as uh, dare, he says dare for there. And I think it's just really good evidence of some of these uh, features. You have to remember though that it's not everybody in the UP of course, or even the Northwestern UP will sound this way. 
uh, socioeconomic class, gender, um, occupations, education affect how we use language and how we use them in different contexts. So those factors are, are at work here too. So take another listen and listen to the vowels and some of the consonants here. This one I like to play in and my four boards are both down. So I gotta fix that. Yeah. The hard part uh, is controlling the roof off all the time, you know. Last year I fell off of it and you know with the snow there it, it, it's a cushion, you know, and you fall in it and it buries you and, and you just lay there and laugh, you know. So far this is not a normal winter. it's one of the highest snow levels I remember for this time of year. But it's going to be fabulous for the businesses that depend on the snow. So let me come back here and hopefully you can see the screen. So you heard, oops, sorry. You heard some of these, and I pulled all of these examples from that um, as just good examples, especially of the vowel sounds here. And then the kind of typical, you hear it in other places too, Wisconsin, Louisiana, dare them does, or dare for there and dis for this. Um, okay, so um, I want to point out too, um, this photo is from the Minor Strike Parade from July 27th, 1913. And I'm not in this presentation interested in the Minor Strike, but what's really interesting to me is when I saw a presentation a week ago by um, uh, Lindsay Hilton and from Michigan Tech Archives, and she was talking about the Minor Strike and the Italian Hall disaster, and she showed this slide. And what caught my eye is what you see in the red box up in the left-hand corner, Kivanaugh. And this is an older pronunciation of Kiwanaw. And so what's interesting to me is the spelling of this that we call I dialect, meaning that it's a visual representation or a spelling that represents the pronunciation. And what you see here is Kivanaw is evidence of language contact between English uh, no doubt German, because if there's a word like Kiwana in um, German, a word, and we hear that VW, right? It would be um, Volkswagen instead of Volk Volkswagen, which we say. It's probably also an influence of Finnish. So that is a really good example of an older pronunciation that has changed, changed over time. I don't know anything about, <coughs> excuse me a minute, I haven't covered any evidence yet about this shop, except <coughs> either it was a liquor store or a bar because they're talking about rye whiskey in the sign. <clears throat> so we have to keep in mind that this is 1913. Only 60 years though, after the, dot, the area was settled by English speakers and after six decades of intense language um, contact among all of the different languages and others that I've mentioned, Another example of language change <clears throat> is in the street sign. Excuse me a minute, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and calcit lat, it's this other example. Um, it's also language change, but also um, a dialect features that resulted from language contact here, specifically English and Finnish. And this sign is evidence of language change as well. The meaning of the sign is rooted in the social and the linguistic histories of the area, but the meaning of this sign and how it's emerged, um, how it emerged is really lost on even local residents, many local residents, not everybody. The two signs, this handmade one in the foreground and the official township sign in the background are located on Quincy Hill, just outside of Hancock on US 41 that you can see here on the left side. And Today, Quincy Mines a popular tourist attraction, and you can see some of the mine scaffolding in the background here. <clears throat> in, the late eight, uh, in the late 1980s, excuse me, Wilbur Salmi, who lived in this area, it's called a location. Um, many of the mines had what are called locations, so um, residential communities that were owned by the mining company and the, close to the mine so the miners could get to, the, get to work. In this area, um, there was a communal pasture and it was called the Flats. Um, the pasture was jokingly called Calcit Lats. And Wilbur Salmi, who lived here, um, wanted to name this street Calcit Lats. At the time in the 1980s, 
streets in rural areas typically didn't have names and it, instead they were known by geographical features or family names or or the location the the mining company um, town name or maybe not towns at the right word or the residential area Wilbur Selmy created this sign and he placed it at the intersection here at Quincy Town um, and he approached the Quincy Township Board uh, with the request that the road be officially named Calcet Lats. And that sign in the background, remember again, didn't exist yet. But in 2001, when the emergency telephone system 911 came in, streets had to have names. And Salmi convinced the township to name the street Calcet Lats. So that's the social history of the background with the mine and uh, why that sign is there. Um, now his sign isn't there. I took this photo in 2002 and the sign was there obviously, but when I was back two years ago, um, the only the rebar remained. So Salmi created this sign based on a pun and maybe you have figured this out. Um, I'll explain it to you, um, but it's the linguistic history um, and linguistic features that give us a clue to what this really means. So the Finnish alphabet doesn't include the letter C and instead uses the letter K for K sounds. Salmi was Finnish heritage speaker and many of the people who lived in this mining um, location were Finnish um, speakers too. The other thing you might be curious about is the S here. So Finnish speakers, um, Finnish doesn't have an SH sound. And so when people who speak Finnish as a first language speak English, they will um, use a S instead, oftentimes use an S sound instead of SH sound or an SH sound. The other thing here that I see going on from a transfer from Finnish to English is that if you remember, I, call, I said this pasture that was here, this communal pasture was called the flats, but here this is called the lats. Well, Finnish has a phonological rule that you can't begin a word with two consonants, what we call a consonant cluster. So people who speak Finnish as a first language sometimes will drop that first consonant in English words that have a double consonant or a consonant cluster. So you've probably guessed that there's this pun, calcit lats, is based on this cow field where you know what cows do. It's really called cow shit flats. One of the breweries in the area has a beer called calcit lats ale. I'm not sure they know what that means. Maybe they do, and it's just a big joke too for everybody who drinks that beer. I don't know. I think the sign is really important evidence of local dialect features and lo local dialect features that have changed over time. Because now, because we don't have any first language speakers, people who speak Finnish as a first language anymore, people don't substitute S for SH. People who speak English in the Upper Peninsula don't drop that first consonant um, on flats. And when people will hear these differences, that sometimes they'll say, oh, the dialect is dying. Well, it's not dying, it's just changing. And it has to change as society changes. So as people who spoke Finnish as a first language or even um, if their parents spoke it, those people have passed on, so we don't have that contact anymore. And regional dialects like local ways of speaking English in the UP aren't dying out. Um, these Two examples that I showed you in the last slide with Kivanaugh and here with Calcet Lats um, just show that there are these second language features that we don't use anymore. And as the community became primarily monolingual English speaking, some features like that S for SH or the S for the SH or the V for the W in Kivanaugh for Kiwanaw, they um, have died off, so to speak, but that doesn't mean the dialect is dying. We still have other features like dare them does for there them does, for example. It's not always clear to us linguists why some features remain while others change. But what is interesting is that some dialects, while they do die off or aren't used anymore, really, um, sometimes they get revitalized. And there's research that show that even some dialect features become stronger over time when in fact they were dying off. But we just have to keep in mind that dialects like language in general has to change as society changes, as new generations pick up new words and pronunciations from places. And so the dialect isn't dying, it's, it's merely just changing.
Another example um, of a local pronunciation is the pronunciation of sauna for what you might say sauna. And um, I, this is a really good example of language contact between English and Finnish and probably other European languages that use the word pronunciation sauna instead of sauna. Um, the pronunciation also signals local identity and this linguistic identity marker in linguistics is called a shibboleth. And shibboleths are pronunciations that indicate insider and outsider identities. So in this set of billboards, we see this use of the shibboleth. Um, these were outside of Ishpeming in 2015. And the shibboleth sauna is contrasted with sauna. So you're an insider, you say sauna. You're an outsider, you say sauna. That doesn't mean that everybody in the UP says sauna. Some people do say sauna. Um, but what's interesting to me is how this insurance company uses this shibboleth and the contrast between the two pronunciations to demonstrate that they're a local business and this use this local pronunciation to symbolize positive meanings associated with being local. This insurance company then is trustworthy, they're honest, they're reliable, they know you and your insurance needs really smart way of using this shibboleth to show that. Another example of a shibboleth is pasty and the pronunciation of pasty. Uh, for some reason, people have a hard time pronouncing pasty if they're not from the area, probably because it's unfamiliar to them for the most part. Um, and this magnet emphasizes local ways of speaking and knowing by instructing presumably outsiders how to pronounce pasty or really how not to pronounce it. What we hear today as sounding youper hasn't always been associated with the UP, however, and keep in mind again, um, some of these dialect features are things that we still associate with people who speak English as um, a second language. Now, okay, sorry. In addition to the pronunciation, I wanna talk a little bit about the vocabulary or lexicon and the vocabulary provides us really good evidence, concrete evidence, because we can see the words, hear the words, and it's also a window into the area's sociolinguistic past and language contact. Here are some lexical features. Now, if you're familiar with the UP or you are from there, especially the Northwestern part, you're probably familiar with these words or some of them, and you probably could even add to this list, just like you could have added to the pronunciation list I gave or phonological features. What you see here are uh, a lot of words that reflect the various languages that have come into contact with the region. Not all languages, but some of the more predominant ones. For example, Canadian French speakers gave us Chuk and Qatar. Um, no one probably uses Qatar anymore. When I was doing interviews in 2000 and 2002, um, I interviewed a man um, who was in his 80s, he's passed away now, and he used Qatar. And in fact, I had set up an interview with him and he told me he had to reschedule it because he had Qatar, meaning this colder congestion caused by damp air. Um, but I don't think anybody uses it anymore. You also see make wood from French speakers and um, that make wood and make groceries. You don't hear make groceries in the UP, but make groceries is typical in other places like Louisiana where French has had an influence. Cornish English gave us uh, bush and bloody and pasty actually. And they might, it might've given us a, um, as in beautiful day, a, and I'll talk about a in a little bit. Irish English gave us the plural use and from Ojibwe, uh, many place names and direct translations of place names. Um, for example, if you look in the first column at the bottom, Laughing Whitefish River, that's a direct translation from Anishinaabemowin or Ojibwe. Ojibwe also probably gave us choppers. Um, there's a similar word. And then there are food names that you see in the lower um, second column um, from German, Finnish, Slovenian, Croatian, and other um, German actually gave us the word bakery and Finnish gave us nisu and Slovenia gave us pavatica. Food ways and place names are some of the best ways that we um, can see language contact in who came to an area, the languages that they spoke and how they came into contact with English. Like I said, these are just a few examples and you might be able to add to the list.
On this map, you see some um, additional examples um, like swampers, which are rubber bottom boots with leather uppers. You see um, holy wa down here in the uh, garden, oops, sorry, uh, peninsula here. It's a really great ex exclamation, holy wa. Um, and you see a lot of other features here. What's interesting to me is that while some of these linguistic features are very recognizable, like yet a and you betcha as you per talk, um, sound is another one. Words like bakery that you see over here, over in the eastern part of the UP, this is a dialect feature, but it's often not recognized, and it's actually not recognized as local, even though it is local. And here's evidence. This is from the Covington Music Festival, a food booth where they were selling bakery. They weren't selling the place where baked goods are made, but they were selling baked goods. And bakery is direct translation from German, meaning the baked goods themselves. Other German speaking areas um, or speaking people, sorry, not speaking areas, but places where German speakers settled like Milwaukee and other parts of Wisconsin, you'll find bakery used in this way too. Hank is another really good example to me of um, how many UP residents, specifically those from mining towns, recognize the word, use it, and understand that it's part of, part of the local dialect. And in fact, some people will argue that it's specifically a, a UP word. Um, however, if you notice in this entry from the Dictionary of American Regional English, what you see here is that Pank is probably not just from Northern Michigan, which is the UP, but it's also found in Pennsylvania, um, Scranton actually, and upstate New York. And what those two places have in common with the UP, these were also mining regions. So we think that this word came in with um, immigrants, perhaps Norwegians, Danes, and Swedes who have a similar word, or it might be a blend of pack and spank. Why we also think that it came in from, with miners is because we have evidence from um, texts from mining journals and different things, um, documents, where they talk about panking powder in a blasting hole. And pank means to spa um, spank and <laughs> pack. Um, I was reading, sorry, uh, to pack down, make something compact. Um, so you can see some evidence here. The Dictionary of American Regional English, uh, they sent out people all throughout the U.S. to collect data from real live speakers. And you can see here some examples from 1937, 1957. Um, and the DARE here is the abbreviation for Dictionary of American Regional English. And talking about um, panking the snow, for example, I've heard people talk about panking laundry in a basket to pat it down, make compact or panking berries in a bucket when you're picking berries so you can get more berries in this. So although pank is used in the UP, it's, I'm sorry to say, it's not unique to the UP. In addition to the phonology and the lexicon, another evidence, other evidence we have um, from the language is the syntax or grammar of language contact and the history of the dialect. And when we talk about syntax, it's usually phrases and sentences and how they're structured, um, how words are ordered. And I'll show you some evidence of that here. And the first two examples are from Finnish English contact. And the third example is from contact between English and several languages. The illative phrase or phrases that indicate movement to or toward a place in the UP, especially in the Northwestern part, you'll hear people omit the preposition. So you'll hear people say, I went post office or let's go mall. And I got an email from someone once that said, I went casino last night. And this is a result of language transfer from Finnish. Finnish doesn't have prepositions and instead has postpositions, suffixes on the ends of nouns that do the same kind of thing, showing relationships. Um, between nouns and verbs or nouns and nouns that pre prepositions do in English. Finnish doesn't have the articles a, an, and the, so you'll hear sometimes those left out as well and where other English speakers would include them. And again, this is result of Finnish English contact um, and what we call language transfer. 
uh, when structures from one language are transferred to another one. Um, so you'll hear people use um, these phrases and they might leave out words like near, or at, or to, or toward. And you see some of these examples here. In the third example, these tags, we call them tags. They're sometimes called rhetorical questions. They're a way to invite people into a conversation or emphasize something. So have a nice day, A, or that's a pretty dress, hey. Um, a and hey are used the same ways. What we're finding is that older speakers use A and younger people you tend to use hey. And there was a student at Michigan Tech um, who had done a study and, and found this. This is language transfer, probably from three different languages, Cornish English, Anishinaabemowin, and Canadian French. And we think it came from one or all of these languages because, well, um, Ojibwe and Anishinaabemowin was there originally. Canadian French were some of the first people to arrive who weren't from there originally. And Cornish English were the first English speakers outside of people who came from the Midwest and um, East Coast. And all three of these languages have a similar sounding and similar functioning tag. We're not sure where it comes from, but it's probably from one or all of these languages. Another example here, the fourth one, is the snow I like to play in. And that came from, I don't know if you caught that, when I showed you the video clip of from the news. And the man who was talking about falling off the roof in the snow, and it's soft and he just laughs, he said, the snow I like to play in. And this is really interesting to me because in English, we typically do subject verb verb object, so I like to play in the snow, for example, and he switches this around, the snow I like to play in. That's probably an influence from German because German has that structure sometime, but it's hard to tell over time where that specifically came from, but I'm thinking it's probably um, from German. It's important to realize that these grammatical features are the rules of the dialect. They are what make the dialect the dialect. They're not bad English. They're not improper or ungrammatical. And in fact, they are grammatical. They're what drive or what are the basis of the dialect. They're very rule-bound features and we can explain where they've come from and why they're used the way they are. When people hear these, they often think that it's bad English or you know, improper or whatever label they might want to give it. But all it is is, in these examples, one language transferring to another. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, what it means to sound like a youper, and connecting that with these ideas that there's good and bad English, and how these are based on language attitudes, and how language attitudes can affect a dialect, who speaks it or not, and how a dialect might really die off because people are pressured or stigmatized or feel ashamed for the way they talk. In this next example, oops, sorry, I went too far. Oops. That's not, sorry about this. All right, this is an example from a student essay, a university student, and um, who gave me this essay when she knew I was doing this research, and it's older, it's from the early 2000s. This example um, demonstrates how language attitudes can and do affect individuals and can also affect the dialect by shaming people into not using it. And I'll just read this and talk a little bit about it. Three summers ago, while I was attending classes, I was sitting in class, listening to the professor read over the syllabus. She veered from the syllabus when she began speaking about the upcoming oral presentations. At this point, she pulled the class to find out how many youpers were in attendance. I looked around and no one raised a hand, including myself. So we know from that that there were other local students here. I did this for three reasons. One, I was a freshman. Two, the class terrified me. And three, I was not going to be studied all term as if I were a dying species. She continued with a comment about youpers who attended the university by saying, stating, excuse me, when they're giving presentations, I always feel so sorry for them. The class chuckled, agreeing that youpers sound funny and showed sympathy. About 10 minutes later, I left the class and almost left the university. This example shows that linguistic prejudice and related language attitudes have real and lasting effects, especially for those who are labeled with speaking bad English or whose professors think feel sorry for them for the way they speak. 
whether it's a regional variety like Yper talk or a social variety like Hispanic English or African American English. For this student, the effects were significant. She dropped the class and she almost dropped out of school. Part of my interest in studying Yper talk and language variation and change in general is my belief that we can foster social understanding, respect, and compassion by creating language awareness. And the more we understand the history of a dialect, the languages that have come into contact and their effects on dialect sounds, words, and grammatical structures, the better we understand the social and linguistic factors that have shaped it and the people who speak them. This understanding can also lead us um, to know that dialects that are seen as bad English or improper are actually rule governed, resulting from language contact. And we saw that in these other examples. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can also become aware that although the rules that make up a regional dialects might vary from mainstream English or from what you speak or I speak or your next door neighbor speaks, they're different rather than wrong or incorrect or bad English. Unfortunately, the prejudice that's often attached to dialects and accents is not grounded in linguistic fact, but instead on prejudice about the people who speak them. Linguistic prejudice is a mirror of social prejudice. In any society around the world, if you want to find out what groups are stigmatized, ask what dialects are stigmatized. Or if you want to find out what um, dialects uh, sound funny or what languages are stigmatized, find out what groups are stigmatized. There's always that one-to-one -one correspondence. It's so important for us to realize that we all have a dialect. No one is dialect free. It's the attitudes and values that we attach to particular ways of speaking and thereby to certain groups of speakers that make us think that some of us are dialect free and others speak at least with a quaint accent and at the most with bad English. All dialects are grammatical and rule governed, although the rules vary. That's why in linguistics we call them varieties. So a variety of English, for example. As we've seen in the previous examples, history and interaction resulting from language contact are key ingredients that have shaped the variety of American English that we recognize as Uber talk. And as we've seen in the previous examples, history and interaction um, and our attitudes uh, toward dialects and perceptions about people who speak them are significant factors affecting dialects and their use. Now, along with negative stereotypes about the dialect or what it means to be a youper, there's also great pride in being a youper and sounding like a youper. For example, in the UP, there's fierce pride about being local as well as a do-it-yourself, get by with what you have, independence that's rooted in hard labor, an isolated place that has a climate that can be difficult to live in, especially in the winter. And this magnet reflects the connections between identity, place, and language with proud, tough, independent, and by mapping Uper right onto the UP. Reflected in this magnet is the most compelling reason for maintaining dialect differences, our identities, our language is one of the most obvious ways in which we mark who we are, where we're from, where we've been, and this includes not only our region, but our social class, our gender, sexuality, race, age, ethnicity, religious affiliations, education, all the ways that we identify ourselves. Language is our badge of identity. How else do we show where we're from and who our families and communities are? And for this reason, dialects, including Uper talk, are not dying out. They'll change over time. They have to change, like I said, as society changes. But as the linguistic landscape shrinks through our online and geographic interconnectedness, local ways of speaking are the way that we show who we are and where we're from. And so they're here to stay. So to conclude, how do dialects like you for talk emerge over time and through us as we shape history, as we share our attitudes about dialects in social media and in conversations, as we interact with other people and our dialects and languages come into contact over time. Um, and as we'll see, we've seen over time, as with any dialect, the sounds and words and sentence structures combine in unique ways 
to create UP English. And by knowing the history of UP English, how it has emerged over time, we come to understand how people, place, and language are tightly bound together. My hope is that by understanding the history of UPR Talk, that you come to understand not only how and why dialects develop, but also that we each have a role in affecting language change, as well as affecting language attitudes and perceptions about people who speak differently than um, you, or you do or I do. I also hope that this understanding leads you to an appreciation of the UP, if you don't already have one, of UPERS and for language variation in general. Thank you. So I will quit sharing here. And that way, if you have questions and comments, I'm happy to answer them or. Catherine, there's not, there's not a chat yet. Okay. But I was going to ask a question. I'm just curious if when you're in the UP, and you let them know a that a is really not Finnish. It's maybe Canadian French or maybe Cornish English or maybe Ojibwe. Does anybody look at you and say, "Hey, you're crazy, lady"? Eh? Well, I have been told that I pronounce uh, the, there's a word s i s u sisu, and it's a Finnish word sisu. Uh, and in presentation a, a long time ago, I was giving on the Ranger, the ship that goes from Houghton up to Isle Royal. And I used the word Sisu in the presentation and someone corrected me later and said, no, it's Sisu. Really good example of language variation, right? Um, and so since then I say Sisu when I'm giving presentations, if I use that word, yeah. Um, but no one's- Variations of it. I mean, I, yeah. there, there are some words that I've run into in, in, in my ethnic community where it depends which block you're on. Oh yes, exactly, yeah, yeah. It's, it really, it can be that narrow or it can be broader. Like in the Keweenaw, you'll see uh, rural areas uh, with street names that have uh, Finnish or French Canadian names on them. And you can see where people settled because of that. And then dialect features. Uh, there's a note here. What are the distinctions between Northern Minnesota talk and Uper talk? Oh, so there, there, are dis, there are distinctions, but there are also similarities, partly because of the iron range that runs up through the northern Minnesota, and because sometimes people would travel along those, you know, the mining, if one mine stopped working, they would go to another one, um, and there were fins that settled in northern Minnesota, so there's some connections there, <clears throat> and also because um, uh, Minnesota had more Finns and Swedes settle there. <coughs> Excuse me. Those languages affected it more than you might hear in the northwestern part of the UP. We had a request if you could post the link to the video in the chat. And if you share it with us, we will do a blog post about your presentation. Okay. And we'll put that link in. Okay. Um, the mm, I got it off of you, uh, YouTube. It was from, let me see if I can find it here. Easy. Well, you don't have to find it this very second. You can okay. put it in the blog. You can just send it to us. Okay. Oh, great. Thanks. That'll save you hunting around desperately for yes. it right now. I, that happens to me too. I, someone says, oh, you got that great clip. Where'd you get it? And you go, yeah, it was YouTube. Give me a minute. Um, do we have, could you, okay. What are you, oh, no, it, uh, I don't have any other questions, folks. Do you have anything else you'd want to ask us before we end the evening? I'm looking if anybody's typing. I'm not seeing anything. Well, if there are no more questions. I did see I, a chat come up. Somebody did put something here. Okay. Uh, I might be seeing it. Uh, where did she say? Uh, I lost it. I just saw it. I'll bring it up here. I'm looking at the. Oh, where? Uh, this was from Marie, and she said, uh, "Where I grew, where I grew up, some of the Finglish speakers were referred to as sing song." Yeah, that's really. Um, so that the more melodic. It's partly because Finnish stresses the first syllable of every word. English doesn't do that. We stress the first syllable of many words, but not always. So it will have that sing song effect. I think it also comes from some of the vowel sounds but that what we call prosodic feature, the intonation curves are from the stress that you hear on the first syllable of every single word. 
So the people will say sauna or sisu, right? Um, where we would say sisu, sauna, it's stress, but not that stress. Well, I have a note from someone from Calumet who says good presentation, but I also have a question from someone who says, do you know if they still post these signs in Finnish and English in um, Houghton Hancock, the street signs? So in Hancock, yes. And in fact, um, I have another, I have a paper on that another presentation where um, this, that was done by the city um, and Hancock calls itself the Finnish American nesting place because more Finns settled there than any other place. Mm -hmm. Um, in the Keweenaw, but now outside of Finland. And it was a promotion in the 1980s by the city council to create these street signs in Finnish and English. They're not direct translations, and some of them are kind of translations and sometimes not. Um, and the blue and white, of course, is the Finnish national colors. The city council also um, wanted all of the shops on the main street to be blue and white, have their signs be blue and white. Some of those still exist, um, but, you know, that was 40 years ago and um, it, uh, not those shops, many of them don't exist anymore, but you still see some ev evidence of that. Okay, um, any other any other questions? I do remember when uh, the, the university up there was renamed Finlandia University and began to market their FU uh, uh, yeah, it's, it was yeah, quite yes. a, quite the discussion down in some places, yeah, especially among our students, right? When you can get that fu hat in, but then Finlandy also uses the blue and white uh, colors, right? The Finnish blue yes, and that. Yeah, yeah. Was, you know, for those of you who don't know, was was it Sumi College before it was Finlandia University? Yeah, it was Sumi College, and Sumi yeah. Suo means Finland, right? So it right. it was a direct naming there in Finnish. Uh, somebody else has put a chat here. Are there similarities between Upper and Southern Louisiana? Yeah. So what's interesting, many varieties of English will um, change the TH sounds, vo what we call the voiced the TH to D, and the voiceless one. We call it voiceless because there's no vibration in the throat. Th, like on thigh or um, I can't think of another word that begins with th, but you'll get the idea. <laughs> and uh, they'll substitute a t or even what we call a glottal stop. Oh, so like on the end of the word south, you'll hear people in UP say south or sometimes south. Um, and because th is a rare sound in most languages, English is one of the few languages that have a th sound, that feature is hard for people to speak. And even though people might speak English all their lives, it's remained a dialect feature. So you hear it in um, Mississippi, you hear it in Louisiana, you hear it in Louisville, Kentucky, you hear it um, You hear it in Chicago, you hear it everywhere where people might say dare them those or something like dare them those in that way. So thanks, good questions. You all have good linguistic ears for picking up some of these things. Yeah, the yes. TH sound is particularly challenging for mm -hmm. many, many ethnic groups because it's just not there in their language. Yeah, and it's and it's part again of, you know, if you have um ethnic or racial dialect, how else do you connect with your community and your identity um, but using those features? Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm not seeing any more questions. So I guess thank you very much for your presentation. Those of you who joined us, thank you very much. Next week, uh, 7 p.m. at 8 on the 18th, we're going to be talking about aquatic invasive species in Michigan and a, and a gift the Canadians gave us that keeps giving. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much, Catherine. It was a wonderful presentation. We all thank appreciate you. it. And thanks, everybody. It was a real joy for me to be with you tonight. Take care. Thanks a lot, Frank. Take care.